This morning, we will hear from Dr. Beatrice Ilari. She's uh, a professor at USC, and she will be talking to us about music and early child development research into practice. Dr. Ilari is Associate Professor of Music Education at the University of Southern California, where she teaches graduate courses in music psychology, the sociology of music, and research methods. She's conducted extensive research with babies, preschoolers, and school children from the U.S., Brazil, Canada, Japan, and Mexico. In her work, she uses a variety of approaches to study different aspects of musical development and growth of infants, children, and adolescents. Her research is interdisciplinary in nature. She collaborates with scholars from diverse fields, including neuroscientists from U USC's Brain and Creativity Institute, and psychologists and educators from the Advancing Interdisciplinary Research in Singing team. She is currently the editor for Perspectives, Journal of the Early Childhood Music and Movement and Association, and serves on the boards of prestigious journals such as the Journal of Research in Music Education, Psychology of Music, I hope I said that right, and Music and Science. You can type it in the chat feature at the bottom, and I know that um, we will be looking at those questions and, and trying to make sure that we get all of your questions answered. So thank you all for joining us, and um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ilari. Dr. Ilari, whenever you're ready, we are ready for you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you for keeping this event going. I'm, I was looking forward to it, um, and it's just great to have, you know, this community of folks who are as passionate about early childhood music and music as I am together. So thank you for being here this morning. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so I can tell you a little bit about the research that we do. And most importantly, um, talk about some ideas that for your own teaching or things that, you know, could be working for you in, in our current situation. So just a little bit about myself. Andrea gave me a very good introduction. So I taught general music for several years. I'm an early childhood educator. Um, I was also a strings uh, educator for several years. I have two kids of my own, a six-year-old and a 10-year-old, so they're at home, and I t work at USC. My research, as Andrea mentioned, is, you know, my main interest is child development. So the things that happen over time, you know, as we grow up in culture, and how does music feature into our lives? So just a few things. I, I fell in love with early childhood music. I started off as a strings educator, and I fell in love with early childhood music when I was in grad school learning about music and NICUs and how music can really um, is so important in the lives of young children. Now, the early years of, of childhood are, as we know, an optimal time for child development, but also very high on educational and, and, and political and economic agendas. So, you know, there are lots of policy documents and people talking about children as our future. And with the what, what we're experiencing right now, I'm sure that this is going to be a defining feature in the lives of our you know, children in this generation. There'll be a lot for us to study and learn from, but a really important piece. And in the world of music, we are seeing a lot of interest in understanding how music features into this conversation. So how, what does music do to children? Uh, how does music exist in their lives? And what can we do to promote it? Um, so that it's, you know, aligned or in connection with child development. Um, so here, just a very brief, you know, map of our conversation. So I'll talk just very briefly about music learning and, and learning transfer, what we know so far, um, and then talk about two main areas. One is cognitive development, and I will talk about executive functioning in, in, in particular. Cognitive development is a very big field. We'll talk a little bit about that, what we know about young children. And by young children, I mean eight and, and, and below, so zero to eight. That's the age I'm thinking about. Um, and then talk about socio-emotional development, which to me is, I think, one of the main areas that we need to be looking into, especially right now. And then the so what question. Okay, great. We learned all of this. So how does that translate into what we do in our classrooms? Um, okay, so learning transfer. Um, so here are my two kids. Um, so transfer of learning is really um, crucial to education. I think all of us as educators, what we want is what we're teaching kids, we want them to bring that into their lives in some way, shape or form. So when I think about my kids doing 
I don't know, math homework or English homework or what or whatnot, or as they're learning music, I want them to expand that into things that will connect to what they do in their lives as they grow up. Um, so when we talk about this in theory, we always say there's, you know, near transfer or things that are connected, like say learning music and learning to perceive sounds. Um, and there's far transfer. So music connecting into other areas like cognition or intelligence or whatnot. In music specifically, we, we have seen way more effects of uh, transfer, near transfer than far transfer. Far transfer is harder to, to demonstrate and it's more complicated as you may imagine. But in terms of near transfer, we have evidence that you know, learning music develops you know, auditory processing and that, that's from both brain research and behavioral research or research looking at tests um, that children will do. Uh, phonological awareness. So there's a lot in terms of, you know, pre-reading skills and also attitudes towards music. I mean, that makes sense. If you're learning music, you're having a good experience. How you perceive music in your life um, will, will probably be positive. So there's quite a lot of uh, evidence in terms of near transfer. Far transfer, as I said, um, we, we know it's very, it's harder to demonstrate and there's a lot of controversy in that literature. But there was a, um, a study that came out in the 90s about music and IQ that continues to be controversial because there's an, a lot of uh, replication. But there are folks who, ha who continue to look at this music make you smarter. So there's that big conversation and it's very, very mm. controversial. But there are aspects of cognition that people have been looking at. Maybe it's not intelligence, but maybe there, it has to do with attention skills. It has to do with um, other areas connected to cognition. And more recently, everyone's interested in social, social and emotional skills. So here are just some areas that have been described in the past and past research. Um, lots of, you know, there's lots of um, controversy about these uh, findings as well. For instance, as I said, cognitive abilities, there's a lot of findings in the early years, um, more um, mixed findings when children, as children are older, uh, Lots of studies on phonological awareness, self-regulation, school readiness in preschoolers, and some studies on mathematical abilities. So those, this is an area that um, I think it's coming back. We're seeing more and more research come out of different labs. And as I said, the two areas now people are looking into quite a lot is still cognitive skills, especially executive functioning and socio-emotional development. So let's talk about cognitive development. Um, so neuroscientists are telling us a lot about how music relates to the brain. You might have seen this picture, it's up on the web, um, and I've seen people use it a lot for advocacy. Um, how we know that music connects you know, different areas of the brain is more complicated than it was, uh, or what we, I, I learned in grad school. But we have seen evidence, and at the Brain and, and Creativity Institute as well, how you know, learning music for several years is something that develops uh, motor areas of the brain and also auditory areas. And that's in a way intuitive, but we're being able to, we've been able to demonstrate that as well. Um, and as I said, people have been looking not so much as intelligence as a whole, but more as these executive function skills. So executive function skills are those that um, relate to, you know, attention, working memory, inhibition control, or for instance, um, being able to hold, or cognitive flexibility, being able to hold like two thoughts in your head. And there's some evidence coming out of labs around the world that learning music formally seems to help the development of these areas. So there's uh, quite a lot of research in this field right now as we speak. There's a big, big study that came out of the Netherlands showing that children who learn music for two and a half years uh, develop, you know, working memory and um, inhibition control. So this is this is quite um, robust evidence. Um, but why would music develop these things? So here's musical chair. It's a game that children all over the world play. Um, so this is a game that where you have to inhibit, you know, your desire to sit in the chair and also listen to the music that's playing around. So that's an example of uh, inhibition control. Um, there are other things. So when you learn to play an instrument, it involves, you know, attention, working memory. Music is all about memory. Um, 
in early childhood and elementary education, we do a lot of singing in your heads. Think about B-I-N-G-O, right? Okay, let's remove the letters. Now think about the music or um, um, listening, in your, listening to songs, thinking about songs in your mind. So that's also another form of executive functioning. And music is about memory. So there's a lot of demand of working memory, action, games, movement, and so on. Um, here's an, a, a little video that went viral a few years ago, and this is not an opera per se, but here's an example where you can see a child, a very young child, very precocious, I would say. I, I haven't seen a lot of two and a half year olds for like this child. But here's an example where you see these uh, inhib inhibitory control. You can see working memory um, as, as the child is musicking. Here you go. Go! Uh -huh. Uh -huh. This is an example where you also see, um, you see both, you know, some cognitive aspects of timing that this child has um, waiting for his dad to, you know, waiting when to come in. So that's another form of inhibitory control. But you also see the social aspect that's so important to music making in, in childhood, particularly in early childhood. Um, so as I said, there are, there's quite a lot of recent research showing these so-called positive effects of music instruction on um, executive function skills. But there are some studies also showing, well, you know, we didn't find it. So there's a lot of conversation about um, executive function skills, although we're seeing more and more studies. And in our own lab in, at the Brain and Creativity Institute, we found in a study of a five-year study, of children uh, involved in YOLA, which is the Youth Orchestra Ballet uh, Sports and a control group, we found that yes, there are effects, but as children grow up into um, early teenage years, these effects are, 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 are gone, meaning that everybody sort of catches up. So there's an issue of development as well. Um, we did a study recently in two um, schools in LA looking at five weeks of music education in TK and kindergarten. So we, through the <clears throat> Thornton Community Engagement Programs, we brought music teachers to schools that did not have music programs. And we had, you know, children do twice a week for 30 minutes. Um, we mixed the classrooms so we could have some children working with children they didn't know. Uh, they were, the majority were English language learners um, and most of them on reduced price lunches. So just for five weeks, and we wanted to see would music, the, this short-term program develop um, executive functioning skills in children. So just to give you a sense of what we did, because the curriculum matters, and in a lot of these studies, people don't describe them in detail. So this is how the class went. So we started with a hello song, we had action songs like B-I-N-G-O, um, uh, the Wheels on the Bus, um, and other new songs that kids didn't know. We brought small percussion. Sometimes there was a music musician that would come in, an opera singer would sing for them. Uh, we had movement. We had um, described what we called musical elements. So we had children, you know, play with melodies, with rhythm. We had objects that they could manipulate. Then we had um, the next phase of, of our lesson was, okay, there's a re relaxation moment so we can return the kids to their teachers. Um, and this was usually a listening activity. They close their eyes and, you know, we would have some kind of um, gesture going on at times. Okay, now you put your hands on your head or let's do some, um, you know, just sit crisscross with your hands um, to think of your breath, close your eyes, and let's listen to a piece, usually a novel piece. So we had, here's where we had sometimes short um, opera um, areas for kids to listen, sometimes jazz pieces, slow pieces, and then a goodbye song. So just to have some structure. So this is what we did with these children. 
uh, we assess them on different things on working memory. Um, so we had this game and you can see the picture over there with there were stickers under those cups and we there was a lazy Susan we would move it around. And we would ask children, okay, where are the stickers? And we would try to figure out, okay, do they remember where things are when I move the, you know, the, the lazy Susan? We also had a test of cognitive flexibility with cards where I would say, okay, here's a blue bunny um, and here's a red bolt. Now we're gonna sort them by shapes. And then in the middle of the game, I would say, okay, now we're changing the rules. We're not sorting them by shapes anymore. We're gonna sort them by colors. And this is where you, you look at cognitive flexibility. We looked at vocabulary and we also looked at pro-social skills, which I'll talk about later on. And what we found very quickly was that, you know, even after five weeks of music, just a very short um, training, that kids in the music group, they had higher scores for cognitive flexibility. So something happened over there. Um, and we're doing another study right now. Well, now we're not, but when we come back to follow up, which we didn't find in the control group. So there was something that happened just by learning music for five weeks, we're very happy with. But so let's move from cognition to socio-emotional skills, because then I wanna talk about some activities that you could you know, potentially be doing with your students that could be useful. Um, so as you know, music is a social activity. Um, children are members of cultural group and young children same way, they engage with music in many ways and with different companions. And so, you know, be, music is, is really social. So you can see on, on the right hand side, you know, the mom singing to the baby, kids experimenting with um, instruments or, or pretend didgeridoos in Australia, an early childhood music class in Brazil, or another as an example from Brazil, children playing and making their own instruments, playing in a band. So this is, it's really an, a social thing. And a few years ago, there's this book that to me has been very um, important that brought a lot of change to my own thinking by Christopher Small, a musicology just called Musicking, where he talked about music as a form of action. So music is not just static, something that, you know, thing that we're going to learn, but it's something that we do. And I think this is so true for those of us working with children um, and for what I believe in music is. Uh, so he says that music to music is to take part in any capacity in the musical performance, whether by performing, listening, rehearsing, practicing, or by offering material for performance, what is called composing or dancing. So really shifting how we think uh, about music and music making. And he created this term musicking, which a lot of us use in education um, to, you know, we're musicking with children. Other scholars have also talked about this and I could give you many, many examples. Um, anthropologist Thomas Torino talked about the humanness of music and how, you know, music is this form of communication and it integrates and unites members of groups uh, with the world. Um, Stefan Kirch in, in the neurosciences talks about the social function, functions of music from contact to, you know, thinking about other social cognition, coopathy, which is this uh, social aspect of empathy, communication, coordination, cooperation, social cohesion. So all these things, how all these functions are so important. And Ian Cross talks about how when we participate actively in music making, we align our emotional states with those of others, which may give rise to a sense of an empathic community. And just to illustrate, um, these are images from the newspapers in the last couple of days in Italy and Spain and different parts of the world where people are isolated, how they're making music and they're connecting with others and you know, communicating. And that's a time when we momentarily, we forget about our, you know, the problems that we're going through and all this, uncertainty and we're just being together in time in the moment and how important that is. So just giving, you know, credence to all what these you know, scholars are talking about. So, but the question is, you know, how does this relate to, you know, early childhood music education or music education? Um, so just two important terms. So we talk a lot about social interactions and, and something that I think we're all thinking a lot about, like it or not, in, in our current situation. 
but the, this idea that you have, you know, two or more actors, two people in this co-regulated behaviors that may be verbal or nonverbal, but this is central to human learning. So we need others to do this. And this is where Zoom and other um, tools come into place and help us right now. Um, and in children, you know, when they're musicking, and they learn with, from and about others. So there's a lot that happens. We learn about music from other places. We learn about ways of being in the world. Um, people are in, say, in Brazil and other countries around the world or even next door. Uh, there's a lot of research about that. Also, we learn with others. Um, we know less about learning um, uh, about things like implicit biases and so on, but there's research coming our way as well. Uh, there was a study that was done of, about a decade ago showing that you know children who make music with others, just a simple game of like Ring Around the Rosy, that they become more pro-social. So they engage in things like helping and sharing much more with others. And a lot of research has followed from this. So research showing babies, for instance, after they sing or they do joint music activities with say a caregiver, that they become more helpful. They will help pick up things, they will, um, or, or um, if somebody is in distress, they will come and try to help you in some way. So it happens very early. Um, so there, there's quite a lot of thinking in this direction. Um, so we know that, you know, parent and child, for example, why would, would it develop pro-social skills? Well, you know, there's joint attention. You have to look at each other. Um, you have to share intentions. You have to cooperate. So there's all of these feelings that emerge as you are musicking with other people. And this is a picture from one of the programs I directed many years ago, children passing an object. And you can see their eye, you know, everyone's, their attention is on the ball, everyone is engaged. Um, in, in the sense, you know, when we are musicking with others, we're building community as well. So the, the study that I mentioned in, in kindergarten, um, we also looked at pro-social skills. So we had this building block game where we asked children, you know, okay, uh, help me build a city. And I had this big story of these three animals and okay, we're building a house for each one of them. And as we were building how, the house, a couple of things would happen. So for instance, I would drop all my blocks. So would children, you know, after we had made music together, would they engage with me and say, here, take some of my blocks, or let me help you pick them up. Or I would have fewer blocks than, than they would. And we would try to compute those and see, okay, well, how are they re responding to this task? And what we found was that, you know, after five weeks of music, you know, children in the music group, they seemed to be helping more, although those numbers were not, you know, statistically um, um, significant. We saw that, but what we saw was that, when we did the same task and we had the children share with each other, the kids who shared were the kids who had strategies, who would say, okay, let's build this together. Oh, okay, friend, um, you're going to put this piece and we're going to make a castle. Or So there was some kind of planning that happened, the idea of, you know, playing together, not just playing parallel. And these, remember, these are four and five-year-olds. Um, and, and another study that we did, um, on the East Coast, we also found that there was a correlation between, you know, children who had spent more time in music programs and helping an adult in a task like this. So there was something uh, positive about it. In the brain and music study, so in the study with old, older children, you might have read something about it. So this was a study that we did for five years. So we followed kids who were starting the YOLA program at age six and seven, and we, we followed them for five years. So we did, you know, brain scans with them. We did, we, we documented their singing, musical improvisation. We looked at the um, other things, um, um, just general cognition, executive functioning, emotional, socio-emotional skills. And what we found with this group, so we compared these three groups um, for three years, and we also looked at socio and emotional skills. And what we found, we found some positive scores, you know, over, over the years for the music, favoring the music group and the sports group. So doing collective things uh, in terms of um, social cognition. And what we found was um, when we asked parents to rate them on a standardized test of socio emotional skills, after five years, that children in music and sports were 
were um, seen as less hyperactive than children in the control group. Um, parents also rated them lo uh, lower in aggression. So there was something that parents perceived, which is important for communities more than just individual scores, but how do the, does the community perceive children as you're going through music? So some of the lessons learned from just these studies, you know, that there's the possibility that music education can develop as executive function. So we are working on these areas. So we're trying to learn more, but especially socio-emotional skills, although we need more research. But here's the so what question. So, okay, so what do we do with all of this? So for me, it's very clear that children engage with music and that we need to encourage them to engage with music in many, many ways through listening, creating, notating, news, moving, and so on, and performing, and so on and so forth. So some of the things that I think, especially now that we're all confined to our homes, um, we have to remind parents that they are musical members. And singing is very, very powerful. There's quite a lot of research showing you know how singing builds community there's research also showing that singing reduces cortisol which is a stress hormone in mothers and caregivers so if mothers are calm you know they can build a better environment for their kids so singing is great and singing you know it can be it's a lot of fun as well it's a form of auditory play and it helps children learn about the world so Let's get parents singing, sing, and even if it's not perfect. So here's a, a video that I like very much. I'm a big Freddie Mercury fan. So this is a family in the Netherlands and they were going to school at this moment. I just want, wanted to share this one with you. I see a little silhouette of a mask. Scaramouche, scaramouche, will you do the fandango? Thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, Galileo, Galileo. I think Freddie Mercury would be happy to see this. <laughs> so sing, 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 get kids singing, sing, sing, sing your sillies out, as Rafi would say. Um, also listen to your favorite tunes, sing, move, get kids dancing, moving to, to music, the music they create, the music they listen to, the music they like. Uh, the other thing is, you know, that parents can do is leave musical instruments and objects, even if, or make sound, sound shakers, that's easy to do um, in the home. And here's an example with, and this is my daughter many, many years ago, just playing with the chair. I'm just gonna show you. Okay, so this is just one, one, one of many examples. And the other thing is to document, you know, if parents, um, they can document these events. This is just something that happened in the home and we just happen to have a camera to capture it at the moment. But um, this is something that, you know, parents can do and also share with their teachers. How are kids engaging with music? And because these, these events happen on and off, sometimes at home, but we just don't pay attention to them. So this is another good example, I think. Um, something I always enjoy doing with my students was, you know, adding sounds to a favorite story. This is something that parents can do. As I said, they can create sound makers, you know, using plastic cups, buttons, seeds, um, and tape. Um, they can choose a favorite book or a new book. If the child doesn't read yet, the adult can read, the child can make sounds, add sounds to the story, create soundscapes, invent tunes to go with the story, sing familiar tunes. Parents can also film the musical story if they have access um, to a camera and share it with teachers, with friends. So that's a good way to share music as well in, in our current times. Um, there are musical stories online. This is one from Weebop, which is a jazz program for early child, very, excellent program um, for young children. And they did Chica Chica Boom, which is a story that many kids know. 
Okay, so there are ways to play around with ideas, with stories, and, and so we get kids reading as well. Um, and here are some resources I wanted to talk about. Um, so the Atlantic White Shark Organization a Museum, they have lots of stories about sharks. There are videos, there are activities that, you know, students can do. My son liked this one. He's a six-year-old. Um, Epic Books is offering, you know, free books for teachers uh, right now. And some of them are, you know, um, uh, recorded stories. So teachers can use those and, and, and kids can use them at home as well and, and add, add music to them. Um, you know, Carnegie Hall, the Kennedy Center, MTNA, they all have resources that, you know, teachers can access um, and adapt to our current um, times. Um, there's this documentary that I strongly recommend that you send out to your parents. This is called Brain Matters. So it's a document done in different parts of the world talking about the importance of early education. There's a very, very short segment on music. It's very, very short, unfortunately, but there's quite a lot of good information um, for parents, you know, to learn more about the research in this area. Um, and an app that I really like is Chrome Music Lab. I'm just gonna switch gears a little bit so I can show you. And this is one, again, that I've tried with my own kids. So they have a couple of apps, they're all free, but there's one, this one, which is called Kandinsky, where children can make music. There's one that's all in rhythm. This one is create your own music. It's very easy to manipulate. So this is one, the only thing is you can't, I, or I didn't figure out how to record what we do, but this is a good one for kids to play with music, especially as they are at home, very user friendly and the kids seem to like it very much. So it's another good resource. Um, and with this technology and, and others, you know, you can have people, you know, students, create, record, send songs to friends, create, create stories, add sounds, uh, sync, schedule FaceTime with friends, with teachers, with um, people sharing songs, um, drawing animals, funny creatures, creating sounds for them, performing for the family, documenting, you know, music making. Uh, Mo, Will Mo Willems has every day this drawing, um, uh, videos that you know kids can access and learn how to draw if that's another thing that will help um, and integrate music to it so these are just some of the sources um, w when I work with kids I also did a lot of you know creating listening maps this is the probably the last video I'll show you this is a very sophisticated one that was done in a classroom setting not my own students this is from YouTube but um, you know, we can do similar things. And with uh, Google Chrome, you can do that as well. You know, the kids can um, think about sounds. Kandinsky is a very good one for this. <laughs> Last thing, drawings in relationship to music, you know, kids can develop all sorts of ideas, what they hear in the music, what they feel, a, a good strategy. And I know that teachers use this a lot. This is something I, I love drawing. So this is another one. And, and on the left corner was a project that we did a few years ago in, in Mexico, where we asked kids to listen to world music and their imagination. So the first one, the kid was saying, you know, he sings with rhythm, he's from India. Then we had music from Senegal and the kid was saying, you know, this is the, this is the name of the girl and she's play, she speaks in Hadian and she is um, um, from Nigeria. She lives in an old house. And the other kid listened, listened to the same song and said, well, he listens, this song is in Portuguese and it could be Italian. So, you know, it was a good way to talk about music from different places like 
you know, Italian and Portuguese and in Italy and so on and combining, you know, knowledge that kids bring and what they hear in music and opportunities to learn. So in conclusion, you know, music has been so important, um, you know, has been shown to be a part of entertainment, communication, it promotes social bonding, it reduces cortisol levels in singers. Um, we know that by engaging musically uh, with children, we build community and we may, may also be assisting with development in other non music related areas. I mean, the research is showing a few things, but importantly, we're building community. I think we need to get that message out to parents. So here another, you know, picture from Italy, people playing music and sharing you know, their art with others. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Please be safe. And thank you for all you do for our children and our community. I'm going to stop here and then try to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you much, uh, Dr. Ilari, for that. That was awesome. I really enjoyed the listing maps on the wall. That was amazing. That's and you fun, right? <laughs> You provided a lot of really good resources for everybody, so thank you. Um, right now, you, if you are, are attending and you're one of our attendees, it's very lovely to see you here, and we're so glad that you could join us on this morning from wherever you are staying safe at home. Uh, I'd like to open it up to questions. I see that uh, Dr. G.J. Christensen has a, a, his hand up. That's a great way of handling it. So, um, Doctor, mm -hmm. do you have a question? I had the privilege a few years ago of doing some uh, music research as part of work at Cal State Northridge. And I was trying to find out if accounting students taking exams or whatever could uh, work with music and that it would improve their performance on exams. Then of course the earthquake came along and spoiled some of that research. But my question is, how can we use the cognitive abilities of college students to have them perform better in the classroom with music? Yeah, there's some, that, that's not my main area of expertise, but there is some research on that, looking at attention and, um, you know, background music, you know, how, how college students sometimes will study for exams, listening to music, does that help or not? Um, so there's some research on that, um, looking at attention. Um, I'd be happy to share what I have about that with you. Um, but that's a great question, you know, how can we... Um, help college students, um, um, you know, I, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I do, I do have some, some resources for you. For sure. I would like to uh, share them by email with you. Absolutely. Um, you know, my emails, um, I'm going to, it's on the, it, it should be on the screen still. Is no, it's at USC. That's, that's right. Please send me an email. I'll be happy to send what I have on, on that, although it's not my main area, but I can point you to some sources for sure. That's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Ulari. Oh, my pleasure. Dr. Ulari, it looks like we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Agnes, I'm not entirely sure I understand your question. It, would it be possible for you to unmute yourself to ask the question? Mm -hmm. um, I'll read what I've got. It says, from your conclusion, it okay. seems that teaching music is more uh, effective than cognitive skills. I have two questions regarding your research in executive functioning. Oh, there we go. Agnes is unmuted, so I will mute myself. Go ahead, Agnes. So assume, there are two questions. Question number one, assume you're controlled for the time of the training for the two groups. Right. What were the differences in curriculum between your experimental group and control groups? So on. The second question is that um, you, uh, you know, uh, manipulate the, uh, the color and shape for your cognitive flexibility criterion variable. Right. But did you control for visual discrimination because that's part of the skill that's not, you know, yeah. really indication of cognitive flexibility? Sure, so let me answer the first question. So about experimental and control. Um, so the way we did it with this school, the, with the two schools is, you know, um, the experimental group had that program, the control group didn't have anything. It, it was not an active control, but the control group received music after the study ended. So five weeks, you know, we did the five weeks of music, the, the, the control group didn't have anything. Once the study ended, the control group had five music five weeks of the same music program. 
So that's how we did it. So it was not an active control doing something else. They were just carrying on with their, you know, school routine as usual. In terms of the cognitive flexibility, so this is a standardized test uh, that has been used quite extensively. Um, so this is a test by, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the, the name. Um, so th this matter. is, yeah. so, um, so in this test, yes, we did, we did have, we used the exact same one that has been used in, in several studies. So the image of, you know, the boat and the, the, the bunny, and then we, you know, we did, um, the, the second version was, okay, now we started with colors and, and this was counterbalanced. So some kids started with a color, some kids started with the shapes, and then we, we switched. And then there was a third phase, which was one where, where the cards had a border. So we would say, okay, if it has a border, you're going to, sort them by shape. If it doesn't have a border, you're going to sort them by color, which makes it even harder. And the music kids, a lot, many of the music kids could actually reach that phase, you know, according to the criteria of the, the standardized test, but some of the control kids could not after the five weeks of music. Again, we don't know if these effects disappeared, and this is what we were hoping to do is to go back to the kids you know, sometime after and see what happened, but now we're not able to go back. So we'll, we'll probably have to redo the study again. I guess that's what I was wondering, because, you know, you're talking about near and far transfer skill, because right. that seemed to be an inference of a far transfer skill, because if they practice this during the experimental five weeks, of course, they would do better compared to the you know, control group. But anyway, these, these are just into the weeds because I'm into curriculum as a how did you actually do it to have some significant results for the experimental group, that's all. Yeah, th that was the only one that we found. We didn't find it for working memory, right? So we're still studying that question and hoping to go back, get back to the classroom and redo it and redo it after a while. But just to, but the, but the kids didn't practice the test in the music class. They just had, you know, the music class as it was. They were tested before and after. So Right, that's what I thought. That may account for the difference. But, right. you know, it, it's encouraging. Thank yeah, we, we were encouraged, but we, we're now like, okay, when can we get back? We'll get back. So thank you for your question. Thank you, Agnes. Um, we do have a question from Wendy. She's got two questions. I'm uh, teaching several students with trauma. I'm assuming the impact of musicking is even more beneficial for them. Is this true? And she'd like to know how often musicking should be done in an elementary classroom with time being an issue and so many subjects and testing constraints. She wants to know how to try to actually apply this in her teaching. Mm -hmm. So the, the first question about students with trauma, there's quite a lot of literature talking about, you know, music and well-being. I think this is the, the area that uh, has been, you know, we studied cognitive development for a long time and then now social, social emotional skills. And what we were seeing is a lot of work on, on well-being and not just from a music therapy perspective, but also from a music education perspective. I think that this area will continue to grow, especially now with this pandemic. And, you know, once we get back into classrooms, there, there'll be a lot of work in that field. So, I, you know, my just my personal view is that I think there's quite a lot that we can do. Um, and again, there's always this and, you know, music therapists will say, well, that's our field. Right. And education is a different field, but I think there will, there is a lot of overlap and there will be even more. So there's quite a lot of literature on where music can help, you know, um, lots of research, for instance, on music where with lots of refugee students or Im uh, immigrant students who are trying to adapt and sometimes developing language skills. And now through music, they can do a bunch of things, right? They feel um, that's, one way that they can participate, they can be themselves. And, and I think that idea of Ian Cross where you don't think so much about the self in the moment that you're making music, you know, it's not that your troubles go away, but for momentarily you're not focusing on them. So I think it, there's a lot of potential. Um, your second question about how to integrate musicking. So I think, um, you know, in our society, I think we've separated music from other things. We've created this idea, well, some people can do it and music is for the talented. And, and sure, the, the, the talented do exist. There's no, no doubt. But I think everyone 
has the potential to be musical. You know, we're born with that potential. So I think we can try to infuse it. And I know it's really hard because teachers are so pressed for time. There's so much pressure coming from everywhere. But are there ways that music can be integrated? And then we can also encourage students to do it at home, right? The same way um, that they do other things, the singing they do, paying attention to it. For instance, in the early years, we know that kids do a lot of music but we often don't pay attention in, in everyday life. We just, oh, they're just playing, you know, they're just, but there's a lot of musicking that goes on. And over time, you know, what we know from the developmental literature is kids start channeling more towards the music of their culture. And then there's peer culture. There's all of that that plays a role. But I think there are ways that, you know, um, I don't know. I had a teacher in school who used to sing all the math equations, and I remember them to this date. So I don't know if that's the best solution, but it's one way that it can be infused in other um, things that we do in our classrooms. You know, have kids bring, or or maybe you know, um, when they're mentioning things that they're doing, can they integrate music in some way, shape, or form? Um, I don't know. Again, I don't know if I've answered, but I think there are, you know, there are ways that it can be integrated or even just paying attention to what we do musically in and out of classrooms. And I think that that might be a one step towards it. Thank you, Dr. Larry. We've got another question from Denise. Do you have any suggestions of what a high school student might study in order to follow a similar path of what you do? Um, what do you mean by a similar path of what I do? You mean music? -ing? Um, I think if Denise, if you want to unmute yourself, we'd love to hear more about your question or, or I can assume that she's asking um, to become a, a researcher like you. I think she is unmuted. Denise? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I guess I'm trying to find out is how would we talk to high school students that, you know, to kind of explore options is before they apply to college, what kind of courses would they be taking, would they be looking at, what kind of degrees you know, in regards to following along this line of your research, what you're doing? Well, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. We do have, I've had over the years, uh, high school students, you know, get in touch and say, I'm interested in this question. And some will, will meet and come, they were coming either to visit us and visit the research lab. There are, uh, from time to time, we will have high school students who want to do some kind of internship in the research lab. So there are openings um, from time to time, um, you know, depending on the projects that are going on and their interests. But we have had um, high school students come and, and, you know, work with us and help us in our projects. And it's always wonderful because they come with so many great ideas and interest and motivation to do things. Um, so yeah, please put them in contact with me um, and I will, um, you know, check what's going on and depending on their interests. I've also had students, interest, high school students interested in writing stories about research and so on. So it's more in the journalism kind of area, if you will. Um, and that's, and we welcome those as well. Just put them in touch with us and we'd be happy to, you know, connect them. Thanks. So one of the other things I want to hit on is, let's say you have the musician students that you want to guide to do not just the teaching music, but, you know, you might want to explore this research, right? So they may not even know about it so much, but they're musicians and they're getting the training, right? So right. Probably, that's what I'm talking about, that student. Yeah, that, 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 that's what I, I was referring to. Not, not, you know, the okay. music student, we can refer them to, you know, the, the materials at school if, if they want to become music majors but these are students who are interested in the research so they can reach out to us and we will see what projects are going on what are you into would you like to learn how to do this would you like to learn how to code data would you like to learn to you know um do a review of literature or we we have been doing this so from time to time we will have people who are interested and um and approach us. So just, you know, feel free to give them my email. I'd be happy to, you know, connect with them. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. I appreciate that. Of course. Dr. Alari, I, I think we do have one more question. And I know that folks are, are really excited by the resources that you've shared. And so I've assured them that we will be able to, to send them those. Sure. Um, sure. And now, um, Dr. G.J. Christensen, do you have a question, sir? 
Well, Dr. Eulari has been so generous with her comments, and I thought that uh, I'm just sorry that I've had to retire because I'd like to go back and do some more music research, and you certainly have inspired me. Oh, thank you for saying that. Thank you. Is there, before we let um, Dr. Olari go, is, are there any more questions that she could answer? Maybe one more question? Okay. Well, I would just like to thank you, Dr. Olari. That was a, a wonderful presentation and I personally learned a lot from it. I'm really excited by the things that you've done and by your research. Um, and we've had several comments that have come in just through the chat saying what a, what a great um, set of resources. I think, um, Gabrielle Serrano is already trying out some of your <laughs> resources and he says that it was off, off the hook. So that is amazing. Um, I, I wish that we could do a, um, the applause that we usually do. Um, so I guess it, it'll, it'll just suffice just me doing this for like a while because <laughs> that was really, really amazing. Um, of course, if you would like to unmute yourself and, and say thank you to, to Dr. Olari, you're welcome to do that. We will try to start our next presentation right at 10 a.m. Um, but if there are things that you'd like to chat amongst yourselves or anything like that, um, please do. And thank you again, Dr. Olari. That was really, really thank great. You, thank, thank you, Beatrice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Olari. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.